Well, morning glory and hallelujah, grace and peace be to you. And what you're waiting for me to say is, Happy Hanukkah! <laughs> or some of you just, Merry Christmas works too, right? <laughs> it works. Hey, this morning, I want to share with you the explanation for life from Jesus' perspective. Uh, death is in our world, but Jesus is the life. We have differing points of view that need to be clarified. For instance, is Jesus a pushover? What did he teach about living forever? How is man's thought different from one who is spiritual? I want to share with you the gospel truth on these points of view this morning. And by the way, Jesus did celebrate Hanukkah. Or at least he was in the temple courts during this time of winter. Hanukkah, the word means dedication. And in your Bibles, in John 10, 22 through 23, you read about the Feast of Dedication. It seems that Jesus was around there in John 10 for Hanukkah. Have you heard of the legend of not having enough oil to keep the menorah burning for eight days? Well, the legend is not reported in, the Mac in Maccabees, um, which is in the Apocrypha, in between the Testaments. Uh, there are a couple books of the Bible where we learn of the Hanukkah story. That's, that's where it is. The earliest that this legend seems to emerge in literature is actually in the Babylonian Talmud, as far as the oil goes. The document that was completed about 500 years after Christ by the Jews who did not return from their captivity to go to Jerusalem. So you, you have this, uh, this commentary on uh, what was called the, the oral Torah by the Pharisees, it was put together in uh, six tractates, and then there, there, was, there was a couple of them, they're called the Mishnah, and then the commentary on the Mishnah is the Talmud. But my point is, it's, it's 500 years after Christ, but they were celebrating Hanukkah during the time of Christ. So why did the people celebrate Hanukkah if the legend of the oil running out was not reported until much later and after the time of Jesus? The reason that Hanukkah is celebrated is because the temple was rededicated. Jesus observed Hanukkah, though. It was on this occasion that he continued to clarify that he is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. Jesus is the light of the world. Very popular saying during this time. While Jesus was at the temple during Hanukkah, Jesus was challenged about his identity. In the first part of John 2, we saw last week that Jesus' first sign pointed to him being the Messiah that would bring the wine. And boy, did he bring a lot to that wedding at Cana. And let me read to you about the challenge during Hanukkah. This is John 10, 24 through 30. The Jews gathered around him saying, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered, I did tell you but you did not believe. The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them from my, out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Jesus' words, John 10, 24 through 30. Some say that Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah or the Christ. Messiah is Hebrew. Christos is Greek. Uh, English, the anointed one, the anointed king. But that's not what I just read in John 10, 25 through 26. He's pretty clear that he, that's who he is. However, we see a tension here between the religious authority of the time and Jesus. You would hope that those running the houses of worship, the, the synagogues, the synagogues, uh, would be thrilled to see the Messiah. That just doesn't seem to be how many of them thought, though. Maybe the religious authority wasn't interested in knowing God as much as they were in the festive traditions of the day. I just can't be sure. Do you think that happens today with people? Do you think people like the festivities of Christmas, but they don't believe? 
we haven't changed that much as people. What we know is that it was around Hanukkah that Jesus makes it clear that he knows who are his sheep and who are not. No one can take those that belong to Jesus from him. And that should be a comfort to us all. We also learn that if you are one that belongs to Jesus, you listen to him. See, the background or history of Hanukkah points to a rededication to the temple. It is in the second half of John 2 where we see Jesus speaking of another temple during the Feast of Passover. But before I transition to uh, John 2 and the Passover, I, I just want to point out that uh, what happens in Hanukkah is there was a rebellion. You had a very evil Seleucid, which was a, a Greek culture um, emperor, who just, uh, or king, Antiochus, and he was doing some bad things, and he, he did some bad things right there in the temple. He, he made it so they had to really clean it up, to say it that way. Um, and that's what they did. And so since they couldn't celebrate Sukkot, the Tabernacles, Feast of Tabernacles, like they normally did, they did it after they had cleaned up the temple from all of this, the idolatry and what have you that was there. And then they celebrated it. But they celebrated it a little later in winter, because that's when they could. And this is the eight-day celebration of Hanukkah. As you know, you have in Sukkot, you have a seven-day celebration plus one, eight days. This morning, though, I don't want to pay much attention, well, or as much attention to the plot or the players as much as the very important explanation. In fact, that's what I've called the sermon is the explanation that we are given about Jesus' understanding of our world. Many have a false idea of who Jesus is and why he came to earth. We learn a bit of human psychology from Jesus, which stems from identity in John chapters 2 and 3. I want to point out two very different viewpoints as we progress through the text this morning and highlight what God has explained. We have an earthly viewpoint unless we have been born spiritually. We have to be spiritually born. Jesus looks at our world with a heavenly viewpoint. So the first viewpoint, though, that I want to, that, that many hold, is that Jesus is a pushover. This earthly view seems to think that Jesus never had a spine. I mean, the presentation is that Jesus just lets everybody walk all over him and just loves them for it, right? I mean, it doesn't matter what. Jesus loves you anyways, right? Right? That's, that's the, the general idea that people seem to have. Jesus does not love people for doing what his father says they ought not to. Jesus was very much a man of conviction. He knew who belonged to him and he did not like a religious authority who were trying to fleece the people of their possessions rather than usher the people closer to the God that loves them. Let me set the stage. See, at the time of Christ, the high priest position was being bought. I said that right. You could buy it. They, they just get enough money together. You go to the emperor of Rome. Hey, I want the position. That's not how it's supposed to be in the Bible. The Bible doesn't work like that at all. In the Bible, you have got Moses, his brother, Aaron, who is the high priest. And the next high priest would be his son. And then it goes on from there. See, there's a legacy. So how do you become the high priest of Israel? You don't qualify. God qualifies you. You're born to it. That's just the way it is. You're born the next high priest. And unless you die prematurely, that's the way it's going to go. But see, they weren't following God's word in so many ways at the time of Christ. Christ enters earth in the middle of a very dark season on earth. It's when people would want to give up hope. And yet, the greatest hope comes right there in the midst of that. In the midst of darkness, light pierces. So, in the first century, a rancher 
might bring his prized livestock to give to God, and more than likely those running the Temple Mount would stop him. I mean, they would inspect the animal and decide if, it's, if the animal is up to snuff to be a sacrifice, you know, an animal without blemish, nothing broken, no bones broken, or anything like that. But the thing is, I mean, you might say, well, that makes sense. But they'd probably do it for a fee. So you couldn't give to God. You could be a big rancher. You could have thousands of animals and pick the best one that you have, bring it to God, and, and they'd be like, well, that'll be... Well, what's your budget anyways? Yeah, I mean, you couldn't give to God without making sure you had extra money to pay for passage up to the altar. You had to pay the people to get to the place where you would give to God. It's not... It's not the way it should be. Maybe we should charge a cover fee for coming to church. <laughs> Some people might think that's a great idea. But no, anybody can come to church. You come to church free of charge. There's opportunities to give to help people, sure. But it doesn't cost money to come and hear the gospel that has been given freely for all of us. Um, another injustice applied to the poor. Doves were reserved as a sacrifice for someone who didn't have much. Right, Mary and Joseph, after Jesus is born, they're going to go to the temple. And you'll see they, they, they make such a sacrifice. You could buy the doves there at the temple, very convenient. However, the price was not being set low. But rather, a negotiation may need to take place to see how much money you have. You know, well, what's your, how much money do you have? You know, we'll make this work for you. You see, it just was all not good. The religious authority were keeping the people from coming to God. They were obviously using their positions to further their own greed. You knew it, and all the rest of the people knew it. So did the religious authority. But I gotta tell you, if you keep God's people from worshiping him, God's not happy. So what did Jesus do? Not what would Jesus do, famous question, but what did Jesus do? This is John 2, 15 through 17. So he, Jesus, he made a, a whip out of cords and he drove all from the temple area, right? You have the temple in the middle and you have the temple mount. The temple mount is quite large. 10 football fields can fit next to each other up there. I've been there uh, many times and uh, some say you could do as many as 400,000 people. I've heard 200,000, but i got to tell you, if you do 400,000, there's no sitting room. <laughs> it's all standing. But there's a lot of room for a lot of people up there. But he drove them all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned the tables. To those who uh, sold doves, he said, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house, the temple will consume me. How would you feel if somebody walked in to your house, knocked over your tree or whatever? Or let's take it to church. You know, they walk, we have a, a beautiful, tall Christmas tree over here to my left. Uh, you can see some of the decorations here, the nativities. Somebody comes in, just knocks them all over, turns over tables and chairs. I mean, would you be okay with that? Would you? Jesus was far from a pushover. He was angry with a righteous anger. The temple was to be a house of prayer for all the nations. Everyone should be allowed to approach God, and God would come closer to them. It didn't matter if you're Jewish. Everybody should be allowed, biblically, to come to the temple for prayer, to bring a sacrifice. It was clear from the Bible who would run it, but they needed to run it for God the way God would want to. So why do you suppose the religious authority didn't arrest Jesus? I mean, he comes and he knocks over everything. He's got a whip. Why wouldn't he? Why wouldn't they arrest him? Well, here's the thing. Everybody knew this wasn't okay. This isn't just. What did the people think? I like a rabbi who will take care of this. We needed someone to stand up to us who could stand up to them. The, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, these, the Torah teacher. We needed somebody who could do this and stand up. Are you kidding? Hanukkah, interesting time. 
a rebellion came. The, the people at this time, it's Passover, they are looking for somebody to be the anointed Messiah, to bring a rebellion against Rome, to take back what is theirs. Could this be Jesus? That's what they're wondering. Of course, we know Jesus is the Messiah, but he didn't come as a military leader on this first visit. He came to save us. That's what Yeshua or Jesus means. So why do you think they didn't arrest him? Well, I think the reason why I'm speculating was that they, the people liked what he was doing. And if they went to arrest Jesus, they'd have to deal with the people. An uprising would probably have occurred. So they didn't want a real riot, if you will. So, the beginning of an uprising, like what Hanukkah remembers, could have happened. However, the religious authority came close enough to Jesus to ask him a very important question. And that was daring. I mean, Jesus had a whip, and he'd already shown that he wasn't afraid to use it. What was the question? Here it is, John 2.18. The Jews demanded of him, what miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? You see, they want to see a miracle. They wanted a sign. They've heard about this sign that happened in Cana, but I don't think the religious authority was really interested in anything that Jesus was going to say right from the beginning. I think Jesus was being prejudged. Uh, why? Well, he wasn't working with them for the goals that they had. He had a different goal. And so they were just going to be opposed to him. I mean, look at he's hurting their business right then and there. Jesus gave a very interesting answer, though. In John 2, 19 through 22, he says this, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. The Jews replied, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. And I think they meant the whole temple mount. They were building it up and proving it. Herod was known for a builder. He was the king at the time there. And you are going to raise it in three days, they're asking Jesus. Verse 21. But the temple he'd spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. And then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. So what sign... Did Jesus offer them right off the bat, immediately? He was saying that his resurrection would be the sign that he had the authority, right? Destroy this and I'll raise it up. Right off the bat, he's saying that will be the sign of my authority. That's the sign. When you see that, you'll know. But he wasn't understood right away. We also gather that Jesus' viewpoint of the temple was that the temple was important, right? It was very important. However, he knew from the beginning that the real temple is where the Holy Spirit dwelled. The Holy Spirit was within Jesus and would be within all of Jesus' sheep. Are you born again? Do you have the Spirit living in you? Because if that's the case, then you're part of the temple where God dwells. If you, <clears throat> The disciple Stephen would be killed in Acts for this very view after Jesus has risen from the dead. But the idea didn't stem from Stephen, it stemmed from Jesus. God's Holy Spirit dwelling in us makes all of us part of that temple. Now Jesus was no pushover, all right? Let me just answer that question. He absolutely came to love his beloved, those that listen to his voice, those that want to do the will of God the Father. And no one, can snatch them from him. Now, as you might expect, the people believed in Jesus for standing, for standing up for him. They wanted a Messiah to lead a rebellion. However, Jesus had much bigger plans. This is John 2, 23 through 25. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many people saw the miraculous signs he was doing and believed in his name, right? In who he was, his identity. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all men. He did not need man's testimony about man or mankind, for he knew what was in a man. So you might wonder, why would Jesus not entrust himself to those that were believing in him? Right? These are the ones believing. Maybe he knew what they would want 
him to become. Maybe a, a rebel king rather than the legitimate king that he really was. I mean, after all, he is the legitimate king of Israel by adoption through Joseph. However, his answer seems to suggest that man or mankind had a very different viewpoint than he held. Jesus saw the world from a different perspective, a different viewpoint. The explanation that we are in need of is found in the next chapter, it's chapter 3. Now we could spend many sermons on this insightful text, but the basic movement of the text has one of the top leaders coming to Jesus at night. His name was Nick or Nicodemus. And they will talk a bit, and then the main speaker will return to John the Baptist, like the testimony that we saw in John chapter 1. And he will continue, John the Baptist, to witness that Jesus is the Messiah. So I want to look at these texts together, right, two, the end of 2 and 3, because I believe there's a viewpoint that is being explained throughout the different situations. See, it's in John 3, 3 that we learn of the necessity of being born spiritually. Let me read it to you. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. See, right away we have Nick, Nicodemus, thinking as someone who does not understand the spiritual at all. See, he's from earth. He knows what he is seeing. Birth is a messy entrance to the world of mankind. I mean, mom's water breaks, a little baby cries for air the first time. Nicodemus was confused. And let me just make this really clear. He's part of the Sanhedrin. Okay, that's the Jewish Senate at the time. He's not just a religious guy. He's not just like a rabbi. I mean, he's, he's so much more. He's one of the leaders. And so he's confused. What is Jesus saying here? John 3, 4. How can a man be born when he's old? Nicodemus asked, Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born, right? And I think this is supposed to be funny. I mean, it's funny to anybody. You think about a grown person trying to climb back up where they originated. It wouldn't be funny to the mother <laughs> if you had children who wanted to do that. But I think this is supposed to be comedic. Nicodemus is like, I'm not putting this together. Jesus clarifies that he's speaking of an additional and different birth than the one that Nicodemus knows of. In John 3, 5 through 7, it reads this way. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying. You must be born again. John 3, 6 gives us a good understanding. See, we're born physically when mom's water breaks, but the Holy Spirit himself gives birth to your spirit. This spiritual birth is necessary to enter the kingdom of God where Jesus is the king. Now, if you want to be part of Jesus' sheep, his flock, then you must, must be spiritually born. Now you know how to be spiritually born or uh, born from heaven because I share the gospel truth with you every week. We are born from above or spiritually when we stop living for ourselves and we commit ourselves to live for God and his way of doing life. We confess our disobedience, our selfishness, and we turn away from it. That is repentance, turning away. However, it is much harder than it sounds. Earthly people would much rather lie and try to cover up their selfish sin than come to the end of themselves and ask Jesus to help them live for God. What we know from later on in this chapter is that we must believe in order for the Holy Spirit to give us a spirit of our own. However, if we believe in Jesus, we will understand our need to repent. Many try to claim Christ as Lord, but they don't listen to him. They don't live for God. They don't want to admit that they need anyone, right? They're self-sufficient. They don't even want to admit that they need God. They just don't. Maybe these are those who see what Jesus is doing, believe in him, 
yet Jesus won't entrust himself to them. He knows what is in all mankind. He knows that we need the Holy Spirit to give us spiritual birth, or we cannot help, but only take for ourselves. See, we, as earthly people, we need a different viewpoint. And speaking of spiritual birth, Jesus shares John 3, 8. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. So why can't you tell where it's going? Nicodemus, why can't you? Well, those born of the Spirit do not value the same things as those who are physically born. Nicodemus is from earth, earthly born. He has yet to be spiritually born. I think he will in time, but he's not there yet. It doesn't make sense because those born of the Spirit do not value the same things as those who are physically born. See, those who are spiritual don't have the same goals as those who are earthly. The spiritually birthed have listened to the voice of Jesus explain, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well, Matthew 6, 33. And what are those things? Well, the things that we need, right? I mean, God will make sure that we have what we need. Whereas earthly man continues to store up for himself treasures on earth rather than in heaven because he's not trusting that Jesus will take care of his flock. And don't think I'm just talking about treasure like money. I mean, whatever it is that, you, that an earthly person puts together for their own security to take care of himself, instead of using God, trusting God, for his, the security that he provides, that's, that's the different viewpoint. Those who are spiritually born trust that God's got this. Those who are spiritually born do things like put others first, different values. They put up with unkindness because they know that the person before them needs them even so. They listen to the heart rather than every word. They love others as they would want to be treated, not because they were treated well, but because that's what they would want. They know God is real because he speaks to them in many ways throughout the day. I mean, the Bible is one way, prayer is another, that still small voice that arranges thoughts that you did not have at the beginning of the day to steer you on a different path as the wind blows you. To do more good for the kingdom of God, something you didn't know you were going to do at the beginning of the day. Um, keep in mind, the wind blows wherever it pleases, Jesus said. You hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with every one who is born of the Spirit. I mean, it's the people. You can't tell where they're going. Why? Because they have a different value system than Nicodemus. None of this makes sense to the earthly man because he doesn't really fear God. He says he believes, but only listens to his own selfish desires. He will say he's following until he wants to go a different way. The earthly man is obedient to himself rather than trusting in God and his way of life. Now Nicodemus doesn't know what to do with this teaching. That there's a Holy Spirit and that he will give you a spirit of your own. I, I think he thought about it. I, I think he's trying to be respectful as Jesus says these things. This very learned man, this leader of Israel. Uh, John 2, 9 reads, Nicodemus says, how can this be? He doesn't get it. Nicodemus asked this. I really think that Nicodemus was trying to understand, like I said, but the concept of a spiritual dimension that he cannot see that overlaps with the physical earthly man was something he did not have any experience with. Jesus lays out the problem in John 3.10. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things. I tell you the truth, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people, the religious authority, I think, do not accept our testimony. See, the religious authority, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Torah teachers, none of them had taken the tour on the other side of our physical lives. Um, sometimes people ask me about all 
you know, what it's like over there. And I, I haven't taken the tour. I haven't died and come back to my knowledge. I've met people that have. And what's fascinating is how consistent their stories are with what they see. Whether they see a, a place of darkness and confusion full of fear and they feel very much alone, that's not so good. Or they see that bright light and they're comfortable. Everything is good. They've never felt love like this before. And it's like more is being revealed to them and they don't want to leave. Jesus' claim is that the Holy Spirit, God the Father and himself have been to heaven. He knows about the Spirit. Jesus does. Don't refuse the humility needed to learn something different. Jesus says, I've been there. Nobody else has. John 3, 12 through 13. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven the Son of Man. Now to a learned religious man of this time, this statement is right between the eyes. And it's very big. Jesus claims to be from heaven. So he has a much greater understanding. But he also claimed that he's the Son of Man. And that might go over a lot of people's heads who are reading the New Testament for the first time. But to a learned Jewish religious person in authority, someone on the ruling senate there at the time. He doesn't miss that illusion. Daniel 7, 13 through 14. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence, right, God the Father. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, Nations, men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Jesus explains to Nicodemus that he's been to heaven. That he's the one to receive from the ancient days God the Father in everlasting dominion over all people. You see, Jesus claimed to be much more than a teacher from God, which is how Nicodemus greeted him. Imagine, Jesus stands before you and says, well, I am the Messiah. I am also the Son of God. I am that one that's been prophesied who will rule all things. I am God. I'm the one. I mean, Nicodemus, he must just, <laughs> I mean, he's just ready to collapse, right? I mean, how can you say these things? How can this be? To say it the way he did say it earlier. As if Nicodemus' breath wasn't taken away enough, Jesus shares these words from John 13, John 3, 14 and 15, excuse me. Just as Moses was lifted up a snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. I've talked about this history uh, before. Uh, it's Numbers 21, if you want to look it up. But it's where we get our medical symbol of the snake on a pole. You see it on the side of ambulances all the time. It's when the people of God were being attacked by venomous snakes. They just had to look up to the snake on the pole and beyond. Right? You're looking up towards heaven, towards God in heaven. Trusting that God would do what they could not do on their own. God would miraculously give them life again. He would heal them. And this was done simply by trusting God and looking to him. Jesus says to Nicodemus that belief in Jesus will amount to life eternally. But somehow he must be lifted up. Now we know that Jesus was lifted up on the cross and that's what he paid for your sin and mine. Jesus died in our place. We had rejected God and his way of life for our own way of thinking. This is where we all start. It's everybody. We had walked away from the one that gave us life in the first place. So what was God's reaction? Was it to throw stones at you once you had walked out on him? 
Did God choose to be mean to you because you had rejected him? Did he use the F word? You know, like filth or foul? No. No. No, oh, that's an earthly perspective if I ever heard one. No. This is the context of John 3, 16 through 18. It's the most disarming reaction to our problem. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever or whosoever believes in him, in Jesus, will not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Jesus. Whoever believes, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only son. See, God loved you and gave you Jesus to save you from yourself. You are his beloved. He loves you. God doesn't like your sin, but he loves you. Oh, he loves you. He sent Jesus to come and get you, to bring you home. The love in God's heart is so overwhelming. He loves you, and that is what he's thinking about. That, he's thinking that he loves you. He isn't thinking about the things that you're doing wrong. He isn't thinking that he loves you. Uh, I'm sorry. He isn't thinking, well, would like except for that. <laughs> no. The love of the Father. I just want my kid. Whatever you did, son, daughter, I just, I just want you with me. You're his beloved. He'll work out all the other stuff. He's thinking that he loves you and he wants you with him. He knows that all of us need to believe in Jesus to avoid the natural consequences of clinging to a dying body without a spirit. John 3.17 makes it very clear that Jesus wasn't coming to harm you, but to rescue you. The King of Heaven came to earth was born to a virgin, would endure torture just to bring you home. This is the truth. Anyone can believe and join Jesus' flock. Anybody. John 3.18 clarifies again, whoever believes in Jesus is not condemned. But if you don't believe, you have refused the rescue mission. Don't do that. Repentance is the key to step into the light. You don't care about mistakes because they have been dealt with. It isn't who you are. Mistakes don't define you. You love the truth and you want to be fully known by Jesus. Trust is there when the fear of condemnation is not. Remember the beginning of John 3.18. Whoever believes is not condemned. Paul speaks of this in Romans 8.1. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. See, a perfect love casts out fear. Tell Satan to take off when he reminds you of a past that no longer defines you. You aren't that person anymore. You are loved. You are the beloved. Jesus is God's gift to you. He has come to you with no desire to hurt you. Jesus is the very best Christmas or Hanukkah gift that you could ever receive. Would you open this present? Jesus being given to us all. He's, been, he's given to us all. But do you want to be loved by Jesus? Do we want to be spiritually born and let the Holy Spirit make us holy? He will have to change our viewpoint from an earthly perspective to a heavenly perspective. 
Do you want Jesus? Will you try to forget him? Will you talk yourself out of Jesus and why he has come to you because he came on his own terms? Will you hide in the shadows or be exposed as a created person whom God loves? And that's the truth. God loves you. That's why he gave you life in the first place. Too often we live in the past. We ought to be excited about being loved by God and coming to him. But the past doesn't define you in Christianity. God's love for you, that defines you. Imagine a king who sends one of his own and he's known as someone God loves. You don't want to mess with that person because you know the king loves that person. If you mess with that person, you're messing with God. Do you understand? The king of the universe loves you. So let's treat the ones that God loves really well. Remember what we learned at the end of John 2. Jesus knows what is in all men. He knows who listens to him. He knows who is in his flock. He knows who cannot be taken from him. He is a good shepherd. And he loves his family. He also knows how all this is going to go down. John 3, 19 through 20 gives us the verdict. I'll read it to you. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. This is the rub. We've all disobeyed God. All of us. We've all done evil. If you tell me that you never have, I don't believe you. <laughs> That's not what the Bible says. If you tell me that you're all done, though, that you'll never do it again, I have a lot of trouble with that, too. Because the thing is, we're a work in progress. I mean, Jesus is making us better all the time. Yet some people want to claim they've never done anything wrong. Jesus came to save us from the evil that we could not help but do. Jesus is the one from heaven. He can give us light. He can give us understanding. However, do you want to admit your fault and get right? Or do you want to try to bully your way to the pearly gates and take heaven by force? You can't. You can't take heaven by force. You lack the power. It's wishful thinking at best. The only way for the person from earth to come to heaven is to be given a spirit. The Holy Spirit gives you spiritual birth when you put your belief in Jesus. Don't let the evil that you've done keep you from coming to Jesus. Let his light change you. Let, let that evil just melt away. Repent. Repent from the evil and let the Holy Spirit make you holy. Don't live in fear. Ask God to help you deal with the fear that your sin will be exposed and leave it behind you. It's not who you are anymore. Get out of the shadows. Don't exchange the opportunity to become spiritual and holy for bullying and darkness. Let me read to you John 3, verse 21. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. When we live by the truth, we have nothing to fear if our deeds are exposed. Nothing to fear. Know that Jesus did not come to condemn you. He came to get you healthy and holy. He wants to forgive you of your past and let his relationship with you define you. Who are you? I'm God's kid. That's who I am. I'm loved by God. I'm the beloved. You are the beloved. Your identity should be rooted in truth. Jesus loves you and there is nothing that you can do to stop it. However, you can turn away from his blessings. Don't do that. Come into the light where Jesus is and let go of your evil old ways. 
The conclusion of this talk in John 3 is spoken through the witness of John the Baptist. He reminds the reader what Jesus has taught. See, in John 3, 31, it reads this way. The one who came from above is above all. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. Jesus is a very unique person to us all. He has a viewpoint about life that he wants to share with us. The question is, do we accept Jesus' explanation about life? John the Baptist continues in John 3, 32-33. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. The man who's accepted it has certified that God is truthful. This literary style of communication leaves us understanding that there are those who have accepted Jesus' testimony about life and God, but they are few. God is telling the truth. He loves you. He doesn't like sin, but his love is so immense that he's come to heal and to help and give us the viewpoint for joy. Life is not about us. We can trust God. He wants to lead us to greater joy for all eternity. Jesus has the power to change us. We need to be spiritually birthed. We need to believe with more than our lips. We need to embrace that God has not brought about death. That wasn't his idea. Jesus is life. And Jesus is truth. He has come to save us and give us life evermore. Jesus is showing us the way to joy, to love, and life in John 3. The world really makes sense when you listen to the shepherd and hear the explanation of what is happening and needing to happen in life. Here are the final words of John 3. For the one whom God has sent speaks the word of God, the words of God. For God gives the Spirit without limit. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in His hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on Him. Don't miss that Jesus can give the Holy Spirit without limit. Jesus is the Son of God and the Son of Man. He is the eternal King, our Savior. He is the author of life and the one to make things right when people have turned their heads away from God. Don't reject Jesus. Don't do it. One might say that they are a believer, but they're not submitting to the truth that Jesus brings us. They tout that Jesus was a good teacher like Nicodemus began with. But the times have changed. And they have to live for themselves rather than trust Jesus' words now. I mean, that was a long time ago. Things are different. That's what they say. The argument that will appear later in John is summed up in the question, what is truth? We live in a world that wants to make its own truth for everyone. Yet we lack the power of creation. We tell ourselves that our technology and understanding of science give us the right to value others a different way than Jesus' love. The message that we get from the Bible is that truth doesn't change. Jesus came from heaven to tell us how it is. See, people like the idea of being loved, but so often want it on their own terms. God's terms are simple. He is so full of love that he sent Jesus to do what we could not. Jesus died for our sins. Jesus gives the Holy Spirit without limit. Jesus gives life for all eternity. No one can take his sheep from his hands. This is the bedrock truth of Christianity. Yet so many want to say, I will give you this God, but I won't give you this. And you have to do what I say, However, that is not the way it is. 
We cannot earn or affect the terms of being born again. We have to want to be spiritual. And the way to see this happen is to trust in God rather than be selfish. It is to love others no matter how they treat you. Why? Because we have so much love in our hearts from Jesus, from God's love, from being the beloved, that we cannot help but want to see others healed. Hurting people hurt people. But loving people persevere in love because that's who they are. It's not because of what the other person did. It's not a reaction. It's because that's who they are. They are the beloved. They are loved by God. They have so much love. It's overflowing. And that's what they want to give. Even if someone is trying to hurt them. Lying about what truthfully goes on in life only makes life harder for everyone. Come to Jesus. And get right with him without fear of condemnation. Jesus is here to rescue us all and give us life with love from him and for others. Let me offer you a quick outline of what we've covered today. John 2, 14 through 17. Jesus asserts his authority, right? You want a sign? When I'm resurrected from the dead, there's your sign. I've got power over death. John 2, 18 through 22, he speaks of his power to resurrect, the central evidence of the gospel. In John 3, 1 through 13, Jesus explains the necessity of being born spiritually, born from above. In John 3, 14 and 15, Jesus is the lamb that is uplifted to bring healing. He's lifted up on the cross to bring healing for us all. In John 3, 16, Jesus is the sacrificial lamb. He suffers for us. In John 3, 17, Jesus is the peace offering between mankind and God. In, in John 3, 18, Jesus is the source of joy because God loves and is not interested in condemnation for those who believe. Finally, in 3, 18 through 21, we read about the issues that need to be settled about coming into the light. It's there that it's articulated what needs to be done. We can all believe in Jesus. Why? Because God so loved the world. Who can do so? Well, the Bible uses the word whosoever or whoever. That means you and your family. When is spiritual birth possible? At the moment when you believe on Jesus, there is no fear of condemnation. This is the truth. It is what the Bible says. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you. Thank you for being so unique. Thank you for having so much love that you would come to us even when we were rejecting you. Thank you that we're your beloved. Thank you that you're no pushover, but in spite of of our rejection of you early on. That you have so much love in yourself that you are willing to come and let it overflow to us who were in such desperate need. Thank you for being willing to make us spiritual for those that believe. To make us spiritual so that when our physical body dies, we can live on with you. And we know you've promised us another body, another physical body that doesn't have the problems of this dying one. We love you, God. Thank you for loving us. Thank you that we are the beloved. Thank you that we are your kids. And that our identity comes from not what we've done, not our past, but who you say we are. We are the beloved. We are your kids. We belong to you. Jesus, you are a very good shepherd. May we listen to you and find ourselves as your sheep, the kind of sheep that no one can snatch from your hands. Thank you.
for disarming us and not attacking us, not throwing stones at us, but giving us love when what we deserved might have been something very different. It's showing us what it is to be truly spiritual. To love because that's what others need. Not letting them dictate our actions, but letting your love in us pour out to all those around us. We love you. In your very precious name, in the name of Jesus, amen. The benediction this morning is John 3, 35 through 36. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life. For God's wrath remains on him. May the grace, and I mean it, that favor of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Happy Hanukkah! Merry Christmas.